being the head of school here. Um, I want to go off script for a moment, and I want to thank everybody who was involved in the dance program last night. <laughs> didn't get the chance to see it last night, go tonight. It is fantastic. It is now my pleasure to welcome everybody to the Elsie Muffy Foster Jenkins 53 Community Service Lecture, and I want to extend a special welcome to the members of Muffy's class and members of her family. Your support has created so many opportunities for our students to follow in Muffy's footsteps by serving with compassion and with courage. I also want to welcome all of our alumni who are here, uh, here this morning and who will be with us throughout the day who are celebrating our reunion. So welcome to all of our visitors. <laughs> Each spring through the Jenkins Foundation, uh, Jenkins Endowment, we invite a leader serving on the regional and national stage to share her personal and professional journeys of service. The Jenkins Community Service Lecture is part of a broader program to deepen our community service experience here at Garrison Forest. The Jenkins program, named for GFS and community leader Elsie Muffy Foster Jenkins, class of 53, and organized through the GFS James Center, supports service league activities and funds the Jenkins Fellows, uh, Fellowships and today's program. This summer, our eight Jenkins Fellows will participate in programs that are based here in Baltimore County and abroad. Some will try, travel to India, China, Morocco, and Sri Lanka to immerse themselves in service. They will extend Garrison Forest's strong service tradition both within our community and around the globe through projects that range, uh, uh, range from uh, designing education programs from children, supporting public health, health initiatives, and working with children who have cerebral palsy. Congratulations to the 2019 Jenkins Fellows and to the upper school as a whole for the commitment you bring to creating change in the world through service. It is now my pleasure to welcome two 2019 Jenkins Fellows, Haley Nickel, class of 20, and Danielle Garton, class of 20, to the stage. This summer, Danielle and Haley will be working with K through second grade children at the St. Vincent's Interim House in Pikesville and Hannah Moore Shelter in Reisterstown, where they plan to design and implement an engaging educational program for the children during the gap between the end of camp and the start of the school year. It is my pleasure to welcome Haley and Danielle to introduce this year's 2019 Jenkins speaker. <laughs> Thank you, Garrison Forest School, 
for inviting me to speak to you today as your guest lecturer for the L.C. Foster Jenkins Community Service Lecture Series. It is indeed an honor to be your speaker today, and I don't take this invitation lightly. I am honored to be here today with my family and to be here with all of these students, because if I weren't standing on this stage, I'd likely just be like all of you, sitting in a chair, listening to someone like me, hoping to hear something interesting and inspiring, and let's be honest, entertaining. I hope by the end of my remarks, you'll think I've done all of those things and more. So let's get right into it. I'm sure in the audience today, there are students who have done extraordinary things. You're probably sitting next to someone who has made honor roll consistently while participating in a number of school clubs and after school activities, and who still manages to serve in her community. A few seats down from you is probably another student who volunteers almost weekly with the elderly, helps out at the local food pantry, cares for animals at the local shelter, or is really big on protecting our environment, all while still juggling the regular demands of being a responsible teenager growing up today. Some of your classmates' accomplishments have gotten attention from local officials, and maybe even from national organizations. And when people come to hear of the great work they've done, statements like this come out of the mouths of grown-ups. One day, you're going to change the world. Or how about, you have great things coming in your future. Have you ever heard anyone say, you have a bright future ahead of you? Have you ever had an adult tell you, you're really mature for a person your age? Raise your hand if you've ever heard anyone say, you are the future. Yeah, me too. As much as I believe that many adults mean well, in my 14 years of life experiences, I've seen how limiting adults can be when it comes to integrating young people and real solutions for real problems that face real people right now. Just one month ago, I was hanging out with about a dozen teenagers from Maryland, Delaware, and Pennsylvania at the Blind Industries and Services of Maryland headquarters in Baltimore, BISM for short. This organization reached out to us in late January hoping that I would allow teens involved in their mentoring group to fill plastic Easter eggs with candy for my nonprofit organization's Extra Special Easter project. You see, BISM had been reaching out to several organizations over the past five years, looking for service learning projects that their teens could support. They had been rejected almost immediately because, as I was told, their disability presented a liability to the organizations that needed help. I'm not exactly sure what service learning project requires rocket science or operating heavy machinery or any other seemingly impossible task where sight is needed. But hear me out. These teens have vision, even though they're blind. I think vision, which is different from sight, is necessary for serving others. Can you imagine how life would be today in Pakistan if Malala never envisioned her life as an educated woman? What if she had never decided to write her blog? At age 11, this Muslim girl took a bold position and started reporting on her blog where she, that she created about life under Taliban occupation. Her father ran a school for girls in her village, but when the Taliban invaded her region, they banned girls from attending school. She spoke out on behalf of girls around the globe and our right to learn. And as she states on her website, the Malala Fund, this made her a target. She further writes on her website, and I quote, in October 2012, on my way home from school, a masked gunman boarded my school bus and asked, who is Malala? He shot me on the left side of my head. I woke up 10 days later in a hospital in Birmingham, England. The doctors and nurses told me about the attack and that people around the world were praying for my recovery, end quote. I'm sure many of you are familiar with her story. So, as you know, she recovered from that horrific attempt on her life. She also made a decision at just 14 years old, to speak out and fight against injustice until every girl could go to school. Along with her father, she established the Malala Fund, a charity dedicated to giving every girl an opportunity to achieve a future she chooses. In recognition of her work, Malala received the Nobel Peace Prize in December of 2014, becoming the youngest ever Nobel laureate, thus proving that there is no age limit on service. You may not be as familiar with Jasmine Baber's story. I met Jasmine in New York in 2015, the same year we were both named Peace First Fellows. Jasmine learned the cruel reality of bully bullying the hard way, especially how cruel girls can be to each other. She felt the pain of her best friend's struggle with bullying and low self-esteem. So 
While in high school in Illinois, Devin started a quarterly magazine to help teenage girls build self-esteem, become leaders, and pursue their dreams. Jasmine is not only the founder, she serves as the editor and publisher. Her publication is called Love Girls Magazine. She said she wanted to create a place where a girl could express herself, find shelter, gain courage, and embrace how special she is. Jasmine secured startup funds from a women's insurance organization, then spent hours teaching herself how to design a 20-page glossy, full-color publication. Next, she began recruiting teens to write stories and adults to serve as mentors. The magazine features articles about the struggles and accomplishments of individual girls, plus tips on ex exercise, fashion, makeup, and succeeding in school and life. In its early years, Jasmine raised more than $20,000 from grants, advertising, and fundraising activities to finance her nonprofit. Jasmine is now a senior at the University of Illinois in Chicago, where she is double majoring in gender and women's studies and political science. Had a then 15-year-old Jasmine Babers never envisioned Love Girls magazine, there is no telling what kind of experiences her best friend would have faced without this publication as a constant, local, and personal reminder that she is important. This magazine is not only impacting the life of her best friend. Love Girls magazine has impacted over 25,000 girls across the nation for the past seven years, thus proving that there is no age limit on service. The issues Love Girls magazine addresses are real life situations girls face on a daily basis. But I was recently exposed to some other realities that don't often appear in glamorous magazines or in the newspapers. I'm talking about the new friends I made a few Saturdays ago at Bism. Many of them made a lasting impression on me, and among them was Alicia Levy. Alicia Levy was born with a rare disease called pseudo-obstruction, where her intestines couldn't process food. So, for the first five or six years of her life, she was fed through a nasogastric tube, which is a special tube that carries food to the stomach through the nose. In 2005, her family was informed that her hospital had found a match for a small intestine transplant for Alicia. That kind of surgery is among the most rare organ transplant surgeries, and she had been on the waiting list for years. The surgery was successful, so it seemed. But later that year, Alicia suffered a stroke, which caused complete blindness in her right eye and partial blindness in her left eye. She's also paralyzed on her left side. Most of her life, Alicia has been, a visually, has been visually impaired and doesn't remember her life when her sight was not impaired. As a result of her stroke at age six, Alicia can only see colors, shapes, and about three feet in front of her. In 2009, she was explanted, meaning her transplant was removed because it just wasn't working. So for two years, she was only able to eat very little. But in October 2011, she received news from the hospital, again, about another donor, and this time it worked. She's been healthy ever since. Alicia wants to pursue a career as a child life specialist. She said the most important thing for her is that she can relate and connect on a personal level. And because she spent an extended amount of time in the hospital with no really good way to know what's happening outside. She says she knows what it's like to be isolated and what it's like not to know what's going on. She knows what it's like to be scared, to be unsure of what the next step is and what's going to happen to you or your family. Alicia's personal experiences, love for children and passion for volunteerism motivate her to move beyond her own personal limitations and have given her vision beyond what she can visibly see. She told me what really speaks to her is volunteering. As part of her Jewish upbringing, she really believes in acts of kindness and that they are a fundamental life principle. Giving back is something she wants to do every day. I'm really struck by something else she said. It's always so exciting to have the chance to help someone in need. I can identify with Alicia Levy's story so well. She may not have done something that made front page news yet, but the passion she holds inside her heart is pure and worth more than any award I've ever won. She's walked a mile in the shoes of the people she wants to serve, and she's open to learning from those who need her help. When she says, it's always exciting to have a chance to help, I understand that excitement as well. I've been doing community service since I was a very young child. When I was two years old, I was hospitalized in Bel Air, Maryland for almost a week. The hospital had a red wagon on the pediatric floor. I don't remember riding in the wagon, but my mom tells me how much I enjoyed it. So did the other children, even though sometimes we had to wait a long time for our turns. 
Months after I was released from the hospital, I was at Toys R Us with my mom, who was going to buy a red wagon for me. She says that I asked her to buy another one for the hospital. But I don't, uh, she says, uh, I don't remember most of this, but what I do remember is going to the hospital with her to deliver the wagon. And I remember the smiles on the faces of the nurses when they saw the wagon. I remember my third birthday party too. It was a princess party. I invited a bunch of friends from our neighborhood and from daycare. We all dressed up as princesses. We wore dresses with ruffles, socks with ruffles, and hair bows with ruffles. <laughs> my parents surprised me by inviting a beautiful teenager named Tess, who worked part-time at my daycare provider. Tess came midway through my party, dressed in a beautiful gown, strappy heels, and a tiara. We all believed that she was a real princess. <laughs> my mom slipped her a huge gift bag that had tiaras and jewelry sets for all of my friends. After we put on our tiaras and big jewelry, Tess talked to us about being kind to others and being of service to others. She knew that a highlight of my third birthday party was giving all of my gifts to the University of Maryland Upper Chesapeake Medical Center, Pediatric Unit. As I reflect on that birthday party, I see now more than ever the pure excitement young people feel when given an opportunity to help. What I believe is that my friends would want to come to my party and help me decorate a humongous gift box that we use to store all the gifts, knowing they would be donated to kids in the hospital. It's safe to say that I just assumed they'd want to help as easily as I assumed the sun would rise the next day. Yeah. Thus proving that there is no age limit on service. It's the same acceptance that carried into my fourth birthday party. I remember that sunny summer day when a local news station ran a story about the Maryland Food Bank running low on food and the devastation hundreds of families were facing. I asked my mom if we could donate food from our pantry. To this day, I have no idea why my mom is so obsessed with buying so many boxes of cereal, cereal and pasta. It's not like she grew up in the Great Depression and is remembering <laughs> days of famine or despair. Well, needless to say, my idea of giving up her prized possession of granola and honey bunches of oats didn't go over so well. <laughs> All jokes aside, my mom asked me if I wanted to try a similar idea as I had tried for my third birthday party. So, for my fourth birthday, we decided to have a 70s party, because the Maryland Food Bank actually opened in the 70s. I asked my guests to bring non-perishable food items instead of toys and gifts for me. We dressed up in 70s attire. I wore bell-bottom flower power pants and had two extremely long braids like a picket. My friends and I made picket signs and did a peace march around our cul-de-sac yelling, veggies are good and school is cool. <laughs> yeah, my mom was the brains behind that operation. <laughs> we also made a love band out of a cardboard box and we spent more time climbing in, a, in and out of that box than anything. I remember the day we delivered the food to the Maryland Food Bank. They were very excited to see us. The interesting thing about my fourth birthday is that while the kids were all excited to come and were eager to bring whatever I had asked for, some parents were quite reluctant to send their ch children to my house with a box of rice or a can of beans. Apparently, there are levels of prestige associated with the gifts parents can afford for their kids to bring to a party. But what's so important to remember, above money, status, and reputation, is making sure your gift is something that is needed and appreciated and making sure it doesn't create a burden for the person receiving it. It is this philosophy upon which I built my nonprofit organization, the We Can Serve Movement Incorporated. We, the We Can Serve Movement Incorporated and its all youth board of advisors creates given opportunities that can be supported by the community, especially youth, to bring happiness to homeless, sick, and foster children. The We Can Serve Movement's operational posture is based on the belief that love is active, strong, urgent, practical, and possible, and that solutions are swift because we believe happiness shouldn't have to wait. I understand the urgency of happiness because there was a time in my life where a single moment to smile was all I could hope for. Seven years ago, shortly after my seventh birthday, I was diagnosed with stage four non-Hodgkin's lymphoma cancer. I was very confused and I had no idea what cancer was or what it meant. I just knew that healing me actually caused me a lot of pain. Cancer is a nasty, terrible disease that no one, and certainly no child, should ever have to face. Even in my darkest days, I came to know that God would never leave me or abandon me. I remember about five weeks into chemo, I squeezed as much energy as my pale, limp, thin seven-year-old friend could, 
And barely opening my eyes or my mouth, I told my mom, I can't take this anymore. I can't hold on. My doctors gave me enough chemo to take me to the edge of death in an effort to heal me. Chemo for me took three and a half years. For the first nine months, I was scheduled for spinal taps almost every week. On average, I took 10 medications daily. At one point, I was taking 25 pills every single day. Physically and emotionally, I was drained most of the time during the first 30 months of treatment. From October 2011 to March 2014, I was at the clinic at Sinai Hospital 88 times. I had 33 spinal taps. I was in the emergency room 11 times and I was hospitalized 11 times, with stays from two to 14 days. I was homeschooled all of first grade and about a third of second grade. I missed a lot of play dates and sometimes I would get really, really sad. I used to wonder what I did to deserve such a horrible punishment. Why did I have cancer? In most cases, doctors don't know what causes non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. In some cases, it's due to a weakened immune system, but it begins when our bodies produce too many abnormal lymphocytes, a type of white blood cell. Normally, lymphocytes go through a predictable life cycle. Old lymphocytes die, and our bodies create new ones to replace them. But my lymphocytes didn't grow up and die off. They continue to grow and divide. There are so many of them that they stay together in clusters and form cancerous tumors all over my body that attach to my lymph node. Why my lymphocytes didn't grow up, now that's not easy to answer. But I know that there was nothing I could do to control or prevent that. I wish we lived in a world where cancer didn't exist. Maybe we can get to the place where cancer is a thing of the past, like leprosy, which in the Bible was a death sentence. But thanks to the Lord, the hard work of my oncologists and organizations like the Children's Cancer Foundation that provides money for research, my diagnosis was not a death sentence. On February 7th of this year, I was declared cured by my oncologist. <laughs> of achieving our goal, 
that were not easily stopped by the problems we face. Young people, we have what it takes to bring about real solutions for real problems that face real people right now. Number two, vision is necessary for serving others. Vision is not based on what you see. You will be limited if you rely on only what you can see. I believe that most times, it doesn't matter what you can see visually. What matters most is what you feel and if you have confidence in the outcome of your plans. Because vision is defined as the ability to think about or plan the future with imagination or wisdom. Just looking at a situation, you may be able to see bad or negative outcomes or no hope. But if you have vision, you can see and use your imagination to create to plan something good for a positive outcome and something hopeful. Number three, get excited about the chance to serve others. How would you feel if you went to help at a service project, but the project lead acted like they didn't want to be there? When you don't show up physically, mentally, or emotionally, when serving others, it looks like what you're doing brings you no joy. When you give to others, it should make you genuinely happy just knowing that you brought a smile to someone. Be sure to get excited when serving others. Number four, make sure your gift is something that is needed and appreciated, and make sure it doesn't create a burden for the person receiving it. When people think of giving things to homeless children, they assume they need toys and games, when really, they need school clothes, socks, and toiletries more than any game. You don't want your attempted blessing to be a burden. Many shelters, group homes, and hospitals don't have much storage space but they don't want to turn down donors either. Bringing in things that can't be used within a reasonable amount of time brings stress to the receivers. Ask before you give to make sure that what you contribute will be put to good use. Whether you're two years old or 20 years old or 200 years old, you can serve others effectively. Everyone has something of kindness to contribute no matter how old you are. There is no rule saying that you have to have done specific things or lived a certain amount of years for you to be able to make a difference. All of us are different from each other and all of us have made a difference. Let's continue to be examples of kind hearts and open arms toward our community, thus proving that there is no age limit on service.